Hello everyone, I'm John Mark Cox. And I'm Beverly Ross, and we are grateful you're watching. If you're local or close to Clarksville, we want to personally invite you to join us in person for worship. We hear from our guests often that they watched online, so if that's you, let this be a personal invitation to join us here at church. If you're an individual or a large family or military, we have something for everyone. Yes, we have something for everyone. We have connect groups from preschool, through adults. Our connect hour starts at 9 a.m. and our worship service starts at 10.30 a.m. on Sunday mornings. We would love to see you here with us soon. If you are not local and you're watching online somewhere, we would love to hear from you. Where are you watching from? Can we pray for you? Email us. We want to be able to minister and respond to you. And our mission here is to worship God, love people, share Jesus, and make disciples. We want nothing more as a church staff than to serve His church. We also want to extend to you the opportunity to partner with us and sharing the gospel through giving. You can give online right now by scanning this QR code or type the link fbct.org slash give in your web browser at any time. Today, we start a new series titled Family Matters. It's a four-week series in the book of Ruth. The message today is titled A Fork in the Road. So let's begin today with a song titled I Believe It. Let's turn our hearts and minds to Jesus and worship and sing together. It's not just a story, it's a living, breathing, walking testimony of a God so good he left his home in glory for the world he loved, for the world that he so loved. No, it's not just a story. I believe in the life of Jesus. I believe it, I believe it, I 
Well, I believe everything they were just able to share about the life of Jesus, but also I believe that this book is God's Word, and I believe it's true from beginning to end. So this morning, let me invite your attention to Ruth chapter 1. I want to encourage you in your hard copy or electronic device to find your way to Ruth chapter 1, and I want to encourage you to find your place there as we uh, focus in on God's Word. A new sermon series, Family Matters, and today we're talking about standing at a fork in the road. I had the opportunity this morning to speak one of our Connect Group classes, and uh, we were talking about the vision direction of our church. And then we were able to talk about some things we're seeing God do in our church. And then we talked about Ruth chapter 1. The title of the message today is Standing at a Fork in the Road. And those individuals in that Connect Group said that describes our lives. We always seem to be standing at a fork in the road. And that would probably apply to every single one of us. But Ruth chapter 1, beginning in verse 6. You follow along this morning as I read. Then she, talking about Naomi, arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law. And they went on their way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters, and go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, and Ruth clung to her. And she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, and here are some key words in the book of Ruth that, that oftentimes you hear at weddings, but this is to a mother-in-law and a daughter-in-law family matters. And here's what Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more also of anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. That's the reading of the word of God today. And so as we welcome you this morning to worship, we welcome the Lord's presence in worship. And so I want to encourage you, members and guests, just to turn around, welcome each other, and greet each other this morning in worship. While our church family is greeting each other, we just want to take another opportunity to say thank you for joining us online. For those that live in or near Clarksville, we'd love to invite you to worship with us in person on Sundays. We have connect groups for all ages that begin at 9 a.m. and worship at 1030 a.m. There is nothing like worshiping God and growing in Christ together. If you don't know where to go or what to do, we've made it super easy for you. Just check out the link below and plan your visit today. We hope to see you soon. Thank you today for greeting one another. Those in the room as guests, we want to say thank you for being here. You may be seated. We're going to pray together. And those who are watching online, we want to give you a special greeting as well, literally worshiping all over the world. This morning as we bow together, we're going to pray together. Then after we pray, we're going to pass the offering plates. And we want to be faithful in giving tithes and offerings because the ministry of the church in our community, but the nations around the world are able to happen because 
of God's generosity first and foremost, but because uh, we're faithful in giving our tithes and offerings as well. So after we pray, we begin to sing. Our ushers are going to be passing offering plates. You can give in there. You can give online. You can give at the kiosk, give in the concourse, multiple, multiple ways to give. But we encourage you to do so. So let's bow together. I want to lead us to pray today. I want to encourage us. As I say these words, I want to prompt you to pray, and I'm going to pray, and then we're going to stand here in just a few moments and just say to Jesus how much we love him. But this morning, would you pray for earthquake victims in Turkey and Syria? Thousands upon thousands of deaths. We've given from our World Mission Fund to help care for people. Many of you have brought items in, and that we're going to send those, that they're going to make their way to that part of the world. But would you pray that people are going to be ministered to and comforted in that part of, of our world, Turkey and Syria. This morning, would you pray for our military personnel and families? Dr. Richard Davis leads our military ministry. Many who have been deployed have come back, and others who have been here have been deployed and they're overseas. We want to pray for them and their loved ones. Also this morning, would you pray for area pastors and churches that we would see God move in our city and county. We're not in competition with one another. We're co-labors together in Christ. And then would you pray, pray for local leaders, business leaders, government leaders, educational leaders, leaders throughout our community, that we would pray for them today. Father, we thank you for the reading of your word. We thank you that we can greet and welcome one another. Thank you that we can give tithes and offerings like we're going to do here just in a few moments. Thank you that we're able to sing to you and we're able to sing about you. Thank you that we're able to stand and preach the word as we think about standing at a fork in the road and we can even call it for a decision. Love to see people come to Christ today. Love to see people say yes to baptism, obedience to you. We'd love to see people, Lord, who would want to unite and affiliate with our church family. Lord, we'd, we'd love to see people who hear your spirit speaking into their lives and calling them out to vocational ministry. And Lord, we'd love for clarity today because many of us are standing at a fork in the road. We just need direction, which way to go. And Lord, we pray you will give that clarity and direction today. Father, I thank you that we can pray for the grieving around the world. Thank you we can pray for military personnel and their families. Thank you that we pray for area pastors and churches. May we all make much of Jesus. And Father, I pray for the leadership of our city and county in those areas that we mentioned. I pray that they will know we're praying for them, but also I pray they will make decisions based upon your leadership as well. And Lord Jesus, we'll never outgive you because you gave your life on a cross for us. And as we stand here in a moment, Lord, and sing, and as we give tithes and offerings, Lord, we say this because we love you. Thank you for first loving us. And I pray this today in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together as we worship through giving and as we worship and saying how much we love Jesus.
most people view my story as a love story. If you're talking about the loyal love of God, I completely agree. Don't get me wrong, I love Boaz and I loved my first husband, Malin. Both wonderful men, but God is the hero of this love story. It started off great. I married into a loving family. We had dreams of green pastures and children laughing and playing together and years of adventure. But then tragedy struck. Death surrounded us. First my father-in-law, Elimelech, then my brother-in-law, Chilion, and then my husband. Naomi, my mother-in-law, asked my sister-in-law, Orpah, and I to go back to our families. She said we could build new lives there, and that sounded great and all, but my heart was with this family and for Naomi. When mother-in-laws ask, you just do. And Orpah? Well, she did just as Naomi asked, but I just couldn't leave her side. I was at a fork in the road. I mean, what would you do? All I could do was cling to her. I could go back to so much and start fresh, or I could stay and let God work right where He wanted me. After realizing I was set in my ways and I wasn't returning, Naomi and I headed back to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. When we arrived, the whole town was stirred. They couldn't believe Naomi was back, but she didn't even want to answer to her name as she left Bethlehem full and yet now she was empty. But God was at work. Just you wait and see. Again today, let me invite your attention to Ruth chapter one. Standing at a fork in the road. As I think back over many years of ministry, I've had a number of embarrassing moments over those years. And I would look at it and say, why did I say that and why did I do that? And maybe you could say the same thing about your life some as well. I remember one time, it was a Sunday afternoon, I was doing a funeral uh, out of town and I uh, get there, Angie and I get to the, to the funeral home and I preach the funeral. We get ready to get in the car. We generally follow a police officer or someone in the funeral home and uh, they take us to the cemetery. But that particular day after the funeral, they were busy, the police officer were busy. And so they said to me, we need you to lead the family to the cemetery. And I tried to tell them that was not a good idea. I wasn't really familiar with the town. And they said, it's easy. And they gave me directions about you go this way and turn here, those things. And so I agreed to do it. And so Ange and I, on that Sunday afternoon, we're leading the family to the cemetery. And so we're on our way. We're doing well. I mean, we turn here and we're, we're making good progress. And then we come to a fork in the road. And the funeral director never said what to do when he got to the fork in the road. So Angie and I said, wonder what we need to do, which direction we need to go. And just on the spur of the moment, we made a decision about which way to go. And when I looked up in the rearview mirror, the rest of the family, they were going the opposite direction. Uh, it was a rather embarrassing moment because when we finally met them, we were meeting our car and their cars were like this. And I said, I apologize, I said, I didn't know which way to go at the fork in the road. Uh, Yogi Bear, the great baseball player, said, when you come to the fork in the road, take it. And so I did, but it was the wrong way to go. Let me ask you, as we begin this series on the life of Ruth, when you come to a fork in the road in your life, how do you know which way to go? How do you know which direction to say, I'm going to go this way or this way? Truth of the matter is, when you and I come to forks in the road, uh, we're, we're going to make one of three decisions when we get there. We're going to come to a fork in the road, and we're going to clearly know what God wants us to do and what we have peace about, and we're going to go that direction. Or we come to a fork in the road, and we, we think we have an idea of what we need to do. We're just not real clear, but we take a direction, and then we come to realize it's the wrong direction. Or sometimes we come into a fork in the road and we slam on the brakes because we just don't know which way to go. And so for a season, we seek to do nothing. I don't want you to raise your hands or answer out loud, but I do want to ask you, how many of you have come to a fork in the road and you would be honest and transparent enough with the Lord, but also maybe with some other trusted people in your life and say, you came to the fork in the road and you took a direction but you came to realize it was the wrong direction. And somewhere maybe a week or two weeks or maybe months, you realize going down this road, well, when you got to the fork in the road, you shouldn't have went that way. You should have went the other way. As we're gonna see in the story in the book of Ruth, it's an incredible story, it's an inspiring story, 
And it relates well to our lives because in the story of Ruth, you're going to see love, you're going to see tragedy, you're going to see tears, and you're going to see tension. Does that describe any of your families? As you look at your family, yeah, you love one another, but you know something in your family about tragedy. And yes, there are times you're going to shed tears with one another, but also there are going to be times in your family you're going to face tension. And you're going to come to some forks in the road, and you're going to have to make a decision. And, and I pray through God's Holy Spirit that he's going to lead you to make the right decision and go the right way. Understand the context of this book. It says, in the days when the judges ruled. Uh, as you know something about biblical history, this is after the death of Joshua and before the life of Saul. And so in the days when the judges ruled, that was not an easy time to live because the truth of the matter, in those days, people did what was right in their own eyes. Much like life in our day. If you want to sum up the, the, where it says in the days of the judges, Judges chapter 21, just literally look on the left side of the page. You're going to see it, verse 25. In those days, there was no king in Israel. When there is a lack of leadership, people tend to do what is right in their own eyes. And so in those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. That's the context of this book. And so there's no king, there's no leadership. People are doing what was right in their own eyes. They were making all these decisions. It was a challenging time to live for the people of Israel. And then we continue, it says, in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So we're talking about in the land of Bethlehem. There was a famine, there was no food, there was a shortage. People were hungry and starving to death. Uh, we oftentimes use the phrase, you say it, I've said it before, I am starving to death. Anybody ever said that? Probably most of us in this room, we, we don't even know what that means when we say that. Uh, but there, in this context, there were people who were starving to death. There was this famine, something that, again, most of us don't know anything about. Because I would say most of us in this room, we've not missed many meals in our lives. To validate that, all you got to do is look in the mirror. And you're going to realize, for most of us, we haven't missed too many meals. And we're not going to miss many going forward either. Uh, when I read this and I thought about this text and realized in Bethlehem, there's this famine, a shortage of food, and people are struggling to find something to eat. I remember being in a nation one time, meeting with one of the Christian leaders of that nation, and he was telling me about his ministry to pastors. And I love hearing how we're ministering to pastors. And so he said he ministered this pastor and his wife, and they were in this period of grief because they had, some of their kids had died. And they'd come around this pastor and his wife to love them and to walk with them through their grief trying to figure out what happened in the lives of kids. And here's what they discovered. The kids died because of starvation. They simply did not have something to eat. And if you want to do something, when you think about missions, that's the reason that we pray and we give, we go, we send, we educate, because we share the gospel, but we also meet the needs of people literally around the world. There are people around the world who are starving because they don't have anything to eat. There's a famine. Can't imagine that in my own life. Can't imagine what it's like to miss that many meals that I'm starving literally to death. But in the days when the judges ruled, there was a word there, but also when there's a famine in the land. And then we're going to see about this man and his family living in Bethlehem, going, standing at a fork in the road, going another direction. Are they going to make the right decision or the wrong decision? Uh, I want to ask you again, if, when you stand at a fork in the road, how do you know which way to go? How, did you know this way, that way? How, how do you make that decision? And I pray over the next number of minutes, the Holy Spirit will give us insight that when we're standing at a fork in the road, we will know by His Holy Spirit's leadership which way we should go when we're at that fork in the road. What should I do about the following? And these are going to come out of Ruth chapter 1. Look at number 1, life issues. Every single one of us in this room and those who are watching, we deal with life issues on a daily basis. You're going to stand at a fork in the road in your life. And here's what I can tell you. You may want to write these words down. When you're standing at a fork in the road, it could be stressful for you. Because you're standing at this fork in the road, you know a decision must be made, but you don't know what to do and you don't know which direction you need to go. It is a stressful time for you in your life. And you may be there today. 
Uh, it could be a time that's painful for you. You're at a fork in the road and you believe you need to go this direction. And if you go that particular direction, you're going to leave the familiar. You're going to leave behind many people you love in life. It is painful to go that direction in life, but you believe that's what you need to do. And then the third word I'd give you is beneficial. There are going to be times you're going to be at a fork in the road and you're going to go a direction. It's going to be spiritually beneficial for you because you believe the Holy Spirit has given you direction direction and peace. This is the way he wants you to go. And it means spiritual growth and use for you in the kingdom of God. And so if you come to a fork in the road, it's okay to be stressed out. Some people are. It's okay. It's going to be painful because you may say goodbye to some things that are dear to you. It's going to be beneficial because God's leading you and growing you in your walk with him. You may experience those issues when you come to a fork in the road. Ruth chapter 1. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem and Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab. Let's stop there for a moment. When it says he went to sojourn in the land of Moab, he was standing at a fork in the road, and here's what that meant. Am I going to stay in Bethlehem, or am I going to Moab? He made a decision that he was going to leave Bethlehem, and he was going to Moab. That was a significant, life-changing decision for him. Now, I want to introduce you because when you come to a story like this, you're always going to look at a story and put it in its context. What is the time of it? Well, it's in the days when the judges ruled. You're always going to see a place. We're talking about Bethlehem and a place called Moab. And then you're going to see people because there are many characters in this love story that we're going to see. And I want to give you some names because in the Bible days, names meant something. It wasn't just the most popular. It wasn't the cutest, but names had a meaning behind them. It's interesting when you study the names of people in this chapter, in this story, what their names meant. Let me give you these. One is Elimelech. He's the husband. He's the dad. And he's the one of the first ones we see. And here's what his name means. God is king. Interesting enough, in the days when the judges ruled, there was no king, but here Elimelech is, his name means God is king, or my God is king, but the problem was, he didn't live like God was king in his life. How many of us name the name of Christ, but at times, we don't live like we're naming the name of Christ? Elimelech was like that. Naomi, his wife, her name means sweetness or pleasant. She was very sweet, she was very pleasant, but she's going to come back to Bethlehem in just a little bit. She's going to be a bitter lady. And then we look around, we see their two kids. We see Milan, and what does his name mean? His name means sick. And then we've got his other brother, Chilean. What does his name mean? His name means dying. And so you've got a guy by the name that uh, God is my king, uh, another lady who is sweetness and pleasant. One son names means sick and the other son means dying. And they're going from Bethlehem to the place of Moab, the Moabites. And, and then you continue in this story and we're introduced to two other young ladies. They're Moabites. One is Orpah. Her name, her name means back of the neck. What an interesting name. Strange name to think. Her name literally means the back of the neck. And then we're introduced to a lady by the name of Ruth, and her name means companion or friend. She's going to be that to her mother-in-law, Naomi. Names mean something. Now, when you come to a fork in the road, and we're all going to come to forks in the road, how are you going to know which direction you need to go? Let's walk through this. Number one, look at the facts. And when you look at the story again, the days when the judges ruled... There was this famine, meaning in, the, in, in Bethlehem, which means the house of bread. There is no bread in the house of Bethlehem. Uh, Elimelech and his family, standing at a fork in the road, they've got to make a decision. Do we stay in Bethlehem where there's starvation, there's no food, or would we leave and go to the land of Moab? Because we understand Moab, there's a lot of resources there. So standing at a fork in the road, what does he do? Life issues. He makes a decision. He leaves Bethlehem, and he goes to Moab. In your notes, you need to put something down about the facts here because the political environment was difficult because there was no king who was ruling. We also know financially it was difficult because evidently people were without jobs but also without food. But also being an Ephrathite, they had financial issues, that, meaning many ways they probably had a lot of resources in life. They had a lot to lose, and so they made the decision to leave Bethlehem, the house of bread, and go to the place of Moab. Here's what I want you to know about Moab. 
Moab was known. They were the enemies of God's people. In Moab was kind of the epicenter of sexual immorality, and in Moab was the epicenter of false worship. So right from the beginning of Ruth chapter 1, we've got this family, and, and standing at a fork in the road, no food, going to stay in Bethlehem or go to Moab. He makes the decision to take his family to Moab where sexual immorality is everywhere, false worship is everywhere, and the Moabites were enemies to the people of God, and he's going to settle his family in that place. Fork in the road. But, but I really believe, though, that Elimelech, he looked at all the facts and said, here's the decision I'm going to make. So let me ask you today. All right, kid, student, adult. When you look at your life, are you standing at a fork in the road? I mean, you've got to make a decision. You, you come to a fork, you've got to take it. Which direction are you going to go? It may be a life issue for you. It may be a family issue, a career issue. It may be a financial issue for you. It may be some other issue. You're standing at a fork in the road. What decision are you going to make? Because we all face life issues. I just want to encourage you, make sure you understand, gather all the facts. If I make this decision, what is going to happen when I look at the facts? Number two, seek God's guidance. It's evident in Ruth chapter one that when Elimelech came to this fork in the road, it's evident that he did not seek the direction of God. He gathered the information he made the best decision that he could, but the mistake of his life, the sin of his life, he didn't seek what God wanted him to do when he came to the fork in the road. I plead with you, whatever age you are, when you come to a fork in the road, make sure you seek the guidance of God when you stand at that fork in the road. Read the word. Rely on the Holy Spirit. Seek out godly wisdom. Seek out what God wants you to do. Put into your life, into your mind, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways you acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. When you come to a fork in the road, if you'll look at the facts, you'll seek God's wisdom. He will give you direction to go. Well, because he's faithful to do that. But it's evident Elimelech did not pursue that because it is going to be tragedy for his family. Number three, think about the consequences. You, you got to evaluate. Now, if we go this direction at the fork in the road, what are the consequences? How's this going to affect my life, marriage, family, our church, our character, our integrity, our witness? If I go this direction, what are the consequences of that? And it's interesting when I look at Ruth chapter 1, Elimelech made the decision to go to Moab to live, but when he got there, it ended up, most of his family died when he got there. What he thought was the right decision to cause his family to live ended up meant death for most of his family. Can you imagine this? Elimelech gets to Moab and he dies. Not only does he die, but two sons of his, Malon and Chilion, they die as well. Now, we don't know how they died. We don't know how Elimelech died. Did he have a heart attack? Did, did he, what happened in his life? Did a camel run over? We don't know what happened to him. We just know that he died. And we know that his two sons died. And can you imagine the stress, the pain, the agony, and the grief that is going on in Naomi's life? And those two sons married Moabite women, Orpah and Ruth, which is another issue altogether. But here they are. The husband, the father, has died, and two sons have died. Tragedy. Why? Because they came to the fork in the road, and he chose the wrong direction. I, when I read Ruth chapter 1, I look back over the span of my ministry and I think about some of the most grieving families I've ever dealt with in my ministry are individuals who lost children. There are people in this room, you, you've dealt with the same, same issue. I remember one family Angie and I dealt with, sweet couple, they had three kids. And, and we had been involved in ministry with them and then their son... Uh, their older son had two sons and a daughter. Their older son was involved in a tragic car accident. He was in the university hospital in Louisville on life support, fighting for his life. They had a, another younger son and had a daughter. And so one day, the medical personnel called the family and said, you need to get the family together and come to the hospital because we don't think, and they called his name, he's not going to live too much longer. 
And so as the family gets together, they go to the hospital in Louisville. And so their older son is in ICU on an upper floor on life support, not expected to live too much longer. And as they're walking into the hospital, their younger son, as they walk in the hospital door, no issues whatsoever. He collapses on the floor and he dies on the hospital floor. So in a span of just a few minutes, they lost both their sons just like that. You walk with a family through grief like that. And then their other son on ICU, he did pass away just a few minutes later. Their funeral had two caskets sitting in the front for both their boys. Uh, we later did, I did the wedding for their daughter, kind of moved on in life. But can you imagine the grief that they faced in the midst of Can you imagine for Naomi here? She's lost her husband. She's also lost her two sons. And she's trying to figure out what, what you do. So when you come to a fork in the road, life issues, what do you do when you're at that fork in the road? I just encourage you, gather the facts. Seek the wisdom in the heart of God, but also evaluate the consequences. If I do this, God, what does this mean for me and other people around me? Gather the information. Number two, personal relationships. What, what do you do? When you come to a fork in the road and the issue is over relationships in your life. And we see that here in Ruth chapter one as well. What, what do you do? I've had people in my life and, and, and I remember sitting down with Angie and I were talking about this one person yesterday. Uh, she had incredible potential, could have served God in great ways, but, but she could never function at her highest level because of the people around her in life. And I, and I shared that with her. I said and called her by her name. If you would just get some different friends in your life, your potential to serve God at a high level is amazing. But she never could do that. I remember hearing stories of Hollywood celebrities who were in and out of alcohol and drug rehabilitation places. And I remember people saying th those individuals will never change. Their lives will never change until they get a new set of friends in life. Can, can I say to the students in this room today, be careful whom you connect your life with in life because they're going to influence you. And, and as 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33 says, do not, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Be careful who's around you in life. And so in this context, again, we, we see nothing but tragedy in the beginning. They make a decision to leave Bethlehem, go to Moab, the enemies of God, false worship, sexual immorality. Elimelech dies, the two sons die, and Naomi is left with two daughters-in-laws, and she's going to make a decision. And the Bible says here, Then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So word was in the fields of Moab that in Bethlehem God was at work. As you think about our church, is there anyone in our city, anyone in our county, anyone around the world talking about the activity of God at First Baptist Church? As you look at your life, is anyone talking about the activity of God in your life? And so as Naomi is out there in the fields of Moab, she hears news. God is at work again in Bethlehem, the house of bread. The good news is there's bread, there's food there again. And she is standing at a fork in the road. What is she going to do? Stay in Moab or go back to Bethlehem? She makes a decision to say, I'm turning my heart back to the people of God and back to Bethlehem. I'm going home again. And what are her daughter-in-laws? They're going to stand at a fork in the road as well. Are we going to go to Bethlehem with her? Are we going to stay in Moab? We're going back to our families. What are we going to do? And so Naomi, in the midst of these relationships, is going to plead with her daughters-in-law to say, go back to your families. I'm going back to Bethlehem. You go back to your families. As we, as we understand the story... One is going to make the decision to go. The other is going to make a decision to stay. It's a fork in the road when it comes to personal relationships. Uh, let me give you these. One, consider God's purposes. When you look at your life and you look at relationships, consider the purposes of God in life. What does God want you? He wants you to worship him. He wants you to evangelize people. He wants you to disciple those who are believers. He wants you to minister and serve. He wants you to fellowship with God's people. He wants you to pray. Those are the purposes of God. And so you need relationships where you fellowship with one another. When the bottom of your life drops out, who is going to be there for you and with you? 
I mean, the bottom of life has dropped out for Naomi. Her husband is dead, her two sons are dead. And so here Ruth is, is going to say, I'm going to be there with you in your time of need. The very words that we would often use at a wedding between a husband and wife is between a daughter-in-law and a mother-in-law. But she is promising, listen, I'm going to fellowship. I'm going to walk with you. You're not going through this tragedy and pain alone in your life. They were 10 years in the country of Moab. And as I read through that, I just thought back in my own life again. Every 10 years in my family, we had had significant death in my family every 10 years. In 1992, my father was killed in a boating accident. In 2002, my grandmother, who was significant influence in my life, she went home to be with the Lord. In 2012, my mother passed away, went home to be with the Lord. And so I lived through 2022 wondering, God, is it going to be another 10 years? Who's going to die in our family in this 10-year span? Gratefully, again, we didn't have any significant death in our family in 2022. It had been every 10 years. And I read this story, 10 years in the country of Moab, and here's what happened. But as you look at this, consider God's purposes. Who's going to be there for you and with you when your life falls apart? Who is there with you? Number two, make the wise investment. Who, who are you investing in a relationship with? Who are you investing to say, I want you to be a friend and I'm going to be a friend? You make the investment in a relationship. If you want to have friends, then you need to be a friend to somebody in your life. If you're going to find encouragement, you need to be an encourager to someone else. Look at these blanks. Friends are necessary. You're going to need friends in your life. And here's what I know. This work gets real personal for us because Naomi is going to have Ruth, who's going to be right there with her. But friends are necessary. Many of us have acquaintances in life. And if they ask you how you are, and here's what you say, I'm doing good, doing great. You're not ever going to tell them the truth. You're not ever going to say, here's what's really going on in my life, marriage, family, career, financial. You're not ever going to say any of those words. They are simply acquaintances with you in your life. Uh, there are others of you who are going to have casual friends. Maybe you do some recreational things together. Maybe you have lunch together. You'll have some conversation. It'll be a little bit deeper. But you're not going to get into the intimate issues of life with this person. Then there are others you have close friends. You have many of those who are close friends. And so you do some things together. But the truth of the matter is, you still may or may not share the most intimate details of your life, even with your close friends in your life. And then pay attention to this. There are many people who have intimate friends. And these are the people who are going to be there at 3 o'clock in the morning when your life has just fallen apart. These are the people you're going to share the most intimate details of your life. These are going to be the people who are going to be there in your time of need. These are going to be the people you can trust when everything around you makes no sense. These are the people. Now look this way. I want you to get this. In this room, those who are watching, for most of us, a lot of acquaintances, a lot of casual friends, even a lot of close friends. But if you can count some intimate friends on one hand, you are a blessed individual in life. One hand. They're going to be there at two in the morning, three in the morning. They're going to speak the truth of God into your life. They're going to walk with you. They're going to be there for you. When, when pain is around, they're going to be there. They're not going to walk out of your life. They're going to walk into your life. You are blessed if you can name those people on one hand. Naomi had who? Had Ruth. Companion, friend. Naomi had her. That's two. Friendships must be developed. You've got to invest time in those, in those type of relationships. Don't just happen. You've got to be a friend, and you've got to develop in that. Then number three, friends influence. If you're going to have people in your life that way, they're going to influence your life. Here's what I can say to you with all conviction and clarity. When you've got these kind of relationships, they'll either build you up or tear you down. When you've got these kind of relationships, they'll draw you closer to Christ or away from him. When you've got these kind of relationships, they'll either make your life meaningful or miserable. That's why it's wise to make sure you've got the right people in your life and around you. Friends influence. Life issues. What do you do when you stand at a fork in the road? You've got life issues. What do you do when you stand at a fork in the road and you've got personal relationship issues? And then number three, what do you do when you stand at a fork in the road and it's about God Almighty? It's about your relationship with Him. 
Because in this story again, she's going to make a decision that, that Orpah goes back to Moab, but Ruth says, where you go, I'm going to go. Where you live, I'm going to live. Where you die, I'm going to die. Naomi, I'm never going to walk out of your life. I'm going to be there. She goes back to Bethlehem, and the stir of the town is about Naomi is back. She doesn't look the same. If they have social media, I mean, it would have been on fire to say, who is this lady? Is this Naomi who left and now has come back? Her husband is dead. Her sons have died. She's got a daughter-in-law with her who's named Ruth. What is going on in this context? And then, and here's what Naomi says. Naomi comes back and she says, it is exceedingly bitter for me to, for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Here's a lady who was sweet and pleasant, but now is bitter in her life. And what's the issue? It's about her relationship with Almighty God. She was standing at a fork in the road. She's following the leadership of her husband. He decides to go to Moab. He dies. The kids die. She hears about God working in Bethlehem. She's going to make a decision to go back. But she says this, that the hand of God has gone out against me. Uh, let's take the mask off in this room. I'm not asking you to verbalize it, but just in your, how many of you believe the same thing that Naomi said? You look at the circumstances of your life, cancer, mental issues, broken relationships, you could fill in a blank. How many of you believe the hand of God is against you in your life? That's the story of Naomi. Fork in the road in her relationship with God. She, she went away full, the Bible says. She has returned empty. And she said, don't you call me Naomi anymore. Call me Mara. Why? Because I am a bitter lady in life. How many of you can identify with this, this mother, this wife? Looking at her, and she believes it's why the hand of the Lord is against me. But, but I want you to see these things. Look at these two blanks. Enjoy life as life is now. Uh, don't always look for greener pastures. Enjoy what you, God's given you in your life right now. Don't ever take life for granted. Don't ever take the people around you for granted. Don't ever take your relationship with him for granted. And number two, give God space to work. I am grateful that Ruth doesn't end with chapter one. If so, we'd walk out of here depressed and we think, what in the world was the purpose of that message? But I'm grateful. Chapter 1 ends, it says, that, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley, barley harvest. God's getting ready to do something in this grieving family because they've been at a fork in the road. Just give God space to work in your life. I would imagine there are people here again today. You are grieving. You feel like the hand of God is against you. Give God space to work in your life. The story's not over. In fact, when you look at this text here, she comes back and she said to them, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara. For the, and and she, she talks about God four times in these just span of a few verses, and she uses two words to talk about God. Look at these. She comes back, verse 20. She said to them, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. You may want to circle the word Almighty. What does that word mean? It means the word, and you're familiar with this word, Shaddai. It means that God is all-powerful and that God is great and that God can do all things. He is the Almighty. And then she goes on to say, and she said, second word was Lord. I went away full and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? Four times she talks about God. One is Almighty, second word is Lord, which means Yahweh. It's his personal name. It means God is good. So in the midst of her grief, in the midst of the pain, standing at all these forks in the road, what is she saying? She is saying, God is great and God is good. Can you say the same thing in your life today? I mean, you, you may look at it in life issues. You've gone down the wrong road and you're paying the consequences of that. Personal relationships, you've stood at a fork in the road. It didn't work out for you. You made the wrong decision. You're facing the pain of that. You look at your relationship with God and you really believe the hand of God is against you. You're at that fork in the road, but can you still say, God, I don't understand what you're doing, but I believe you are the Almighty. You are powerful. You are great. I believe you are Lord Yahweh. I believe you're good to me. Even when everything seems to be falling apart around me, God, you are great and God, you are good. Give him space to work in your life. Give him space. You're standing at a fork in the road. Uh, you're going to make a decision. 
Go the right way, don't go the wrong way. Make the right decision. It's going to draw you closer to the Lord, not away from Him. Make the decision that if you're standing at a fork in the road and you need to give your life to Christ, don't walk away saying, I'll do it another day. Give your life to Christ today. Make the right decision. You know Christ, but you've never followed him in believer's baptism. You're going to stand at a fork in the road in this invitation. Don't go the wrong way and say, I'll do it sometime. No, make the decision to say, I'm going to be obedient to Jesus. I'm going to surrender all. I'm saying yes to his leadership. You stand at a fork in the road about church affiliation and membership. Make sure you go the right way. God wants you united with a church family, a body of believers who will love you and walk with you in your life. God's calling in the ministry. Don't say, oh, I don't believe I'm worthy to do that. I don't believe I'm gifted. No, no, follow. If God's calling you, obey the leadership of God in your life. When you come to a fork in the road, follow the leadership of the Spirit. How is he leading you today? And when he leads you, come to that point to say, God, I may not understand everything. I don't even understand what you're doing. But God, I surrender everything to you. I surrender all. Because in this story, there's love, there's tragedy, there are tears, and there's tension. But give God space to work. Let's bow together as we pray. As we bow together today and pray again, I want to ask you in the room and those here watching to make a decision at a fork in the road to go God's direction in your life. Follow his, this, this fierce leadership. And here's what I challenge you. Here's what I appeal to you. Give your life to Christ this morning. Say yes to him about believer's baptism today. Say yes about joining the fellowship of this church. If God's called you, just come forward. We'd love to pray with you and walk with you through that call, that assignment in your life from him. And then if you're looking at life issues or relational issues, with family members or friends or even issues in relationship to God. Why does God seem unfair in my life? And you're standing at a fork in the road. Make sure you go the way God wants you to go. Draw near to him. Surrender all to him. And give him space to work in your life. Some of you today just need to come forward and pray and just say, God, I give you space to work. What seems to be hopeless, painful, tragic, God, I just, I'm stopped trying to figure this out myself. And I'm going to give you space to work. And just let God take over of your life. So that you surrender everything to him. Father, thank you for the invitation to surrender everything to you. Father, thank you that you surrendered your only son for us. And that in Jesus, we can find direction and life and peace and we can be set free. But God, in this room and those who watch, I pray we will give you space to work because we surrender all to you. At a fork in the road, Lord. Oh, God, protect us that we don't go the wrong way. Help us to go the way that you desire. Help us to go the way that will draw us closer to you. And God, we may be bitter and angry right now, but you're going to set us free and show us redemption right before our eyes. Why? Because we trust you and surrender all and follow you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
day today. What a challenge. How do we make hard choices at the fork in the road? And just because the service is over does not mean the invitation to respond is. If you have any questions about anything, please email us. Someone on our staff will respond to you. Let me say thank you again for watching online this week. Share today's message with someone you love. Speaking of love, we love you church. And we'll see you next week.